A very interesting and particularly troubling class of voting paradoxes are those that arise when a voting method does not satisfy a very natural monotonicity property. Now the monotonicity property that I have in mind can be informally described as follows. A candidate receiving more support shouldn't make her worse off. Now, of course, this is a very, very natural idea, right? I mean, the candidates go out, they run an election, they campaign. The goal of campaigning is to garner as much support as you can from the voters. It certainly would be counterintuitive if we were using a voting method that somehow would harm a candidate if he or she received too much support from the voters. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at a voting method, plurality with runoff, that does not satisfy different variants of this very natural monotonicity property. The paradoxes we're going to look at were discussed in this nice article by Peter Fishburne and Stephen Brams, where they first identified uh, these problems with plurality with runoff. Now, in order to make this a little bit more concrete or a little bit more precise, we need to think a bit more about what it actually means to receive more support from the voters. So one way of understanding what it means to receive more support gives rise to what's called the more is less paradox. So the idea here is you get more support from the voters if there are some voters that move you up in their rankings. Otherwise, they keep everything else the same. So the more is less paradox this arises in situations if there's a candidate C that's elected under a given profile of rankings. So we have some election E. We have a set of voters, 1 up to N. Each of these voters have rankings over the set of candidates. Now, under this election or under this profile of, of rankings, candidate C is declared the winner. The more is less paradox arises when if we move to a different election scenario where we have the same set of voters, 1, 2, up to N, but some of the voters have changed their rankings just a little bit. And the way they change their rankings is they take candidate C and candidate C moves up in the rankings. So rather than being, for example, maybe voter one ranked candidate C last, candidate C moves up to being first place. Otherwise, all the other relative orderings between the candidates remains exactly the same. Uh, and for example, maybe voter three ranked candidate C at the third position, but now in the new election scenario, candidate C moves up to the second position. Otherwise, let's just say everybody else keeps candidate C, keeps their rankings exactly fixed. The paradox arises when candidate C ends up losing this election, which certainly seems counterintuitive, right? Because some of the voters decided that C should move up in their rankings, so C seems to be doing better in the rankings. But when we actually run the election, C actually loses in this scenario. So let's look at an example to illustrate this. Here's two election scenarios, E and E prime. And what you can notice is that the only difference between these two election scenarios is that in this group of two voters, they move candidate A from second place to first place. So that's the only difference. This group of voters, their rankings are the same. The second group of voters' rankings are the same. Third groups of voters' their rankings are the same. It's only with the last group of voters, their rankings change. And how do they change? Well, they move candidate B from second place to first place. Of course, that naturally means, I'm uh, sorry, A from second place to first place. Naturally, that means that candidate B has to move from first to second and so on. So, but the important point is candidate A moves up in the rankings. So on, it's natural to say that A has more support in the rightmost uh, profile of voters. So A has more su support over here than A has in the first set of profiles. So let's see what happens when we determine the winner using plurality with runoff. 
So plurality with runoff, you check to see if anybody gets a simple majority. If nobody gets a simple majority in the first round, then the candidate with the fewest number of first place votes is removed from the election. And then whichever candidate has the most uh, ha receives, as soon as the candidate receives a simple majority, then he or she is declared the winner. So candidate A gets six votes, candidate B gets six votes, and candidate C gets five votes. Since there's 10, 12, 17 voters overall, nobody receives a simple majority. So candidate C, since C has the fewest number of first place votes, is removed from the election scenario. And what happens here is all of candidate, all of this group's votes gets transferred from C to A, and candidate A then is going to be declared the winner with 11 votes. So the winner in this election scenario is candidate A. So that's great. A does really good. Now remember, this scenario, the, the scenario on the right, candidate A received more support. So since A won over here, more there's more support for A over in the second election, the election on the right. Naturally, we would expect candidate A to win. So let's see what happens. Well, what happens is, note that candidate A has eight votes, C has five votes, and B has four votes. Again, nobody has a simple majority, so we have to drop the candidate with the fewest number of first place votes. In this case, it's now candidate B that actually gets dropped in the first round. So since candidate B gets dropped in the first round, all of this group's, this third group's votes gets transferred to candidate C, and lo and behold, what happens is candidate C actually wins the election. So this certainly seems odd, right? I mean, if we take a look at it, C is this, the, the last group. C is the lowest ranked candidate. So it's their least favorite candidate. And suppose that they hold in, uh, some type of poll before the election, and, it, and it's shown that, that A is projected to be the winner. Well, these two voters over here, they decide, well, since A is going to be the winner, I'd rather jump on the bandwagon. So I might as well rank A first rather than second. So in order, by doing that, what actually happens is candidate C, their least favorite candidate, turns out to be the winner. So this is the more is less paradox. Now, there's another way in which a voting system may fail this monotonicity property. And this is the idea that another way in which you can get more support is by having more people show up to the election to vote for you. So the no-show paradox is a situation in which a voter may actually obtain a more preferable outcome if he decides not to participate in the election rather than if he decides to actually participate in the election, all else being remaining fixed. So this is certainly counterintuitive if they hold an election without me where, the, where I don't register my vote. There's a particular outcome that I, I like that outcome. Maybe my first or second ranked candidate is declared the winner. But in the situation in which I would actually show up and register my ranking, so giving more support to that candidate that won the election without me, my favorite candidate or my second favorite candidate ends up losing the election. So that certainly seems counterintuitive. There's different ways to understand the no-show paradox or different variants of it. One is called the twin paradox. And this is a situation in which a voter may obtain a less preferable outcome if his twin or his clone shows up to the election. So the idea is I have a ranking over the candidates. Naturally, I would want lots and lots of other people to share my ranking because it would be better reflected in the overall outcome. The twin paradox arises when it's actually the, the outcome is less preferred according to my own preferences, if there are more or lots and lots of clones of my own ranking. These are all simplifications or variants of what's called the truncation paradox. The truncation paradox says that a voter may obtain a more preferable outcome if he only reveals part of his overall ranking of the candidates. 
So the no-show paradox is when you don't reveal any of your overall ranking. The truncation paradox arises when you only, it's in your interest to only reveal part of your overall ranking. So let's look at an example of the no-show paradox. Again, we're going to pick on plurality with runoff. So plurality with runoff, here's our election scenario. Um, under plurality with runoff, we see that candidate C gets four, vote, four first place votes, candidate A gets four first place votes, but candidate B only gets three. Nobody gets a simple majority. There are 10, 11 people overall, so nobody gets a simple majority. So candidate B is dropped from the first round of the election because B received the fewest first place votes. When that happens, B's votes are transferred to candidate C, and C wins seven to four. So C is declared the winner. Now let's see what would happen if two of the voters in the first group decided not to show up to the election. So with all of the voters in the first group showing up to the election, their least favorite candidate is declared the winner. That's who actually won the election. But if only two people from this first group showed up to the election. Let's see what happens. Well, what happens is, again, we do the calculation, but rather than having B drop out in the first round, we see that candidate A is dropped from the first round because B now has three first place votes, C has four, but since two people didn't show up from the first round, only A only gets two first place votes. So candidate A is dropped from the election. What happens then is the two votes are transferred to candidate B. So B has five votes and C has four votes. So candidate B is now declared the winner. But this is counterintuitive because it seems that two of the voters in this first group of voters actually have an incentive not to show up to the election. Because if all of them show up to the election, and register their, their same, the same rankings, their least favorite candidate is declared the winner. But if only half of them show up, then in fact, their second favorite candidate is declared the winner. This, you can also see this as a version, if we kind of turn it around, we see a version of the twin paradox. So what happens here is rather than starting with the election on the left, we're gonna start with the election on the right. And in this election scenario, we only have two people with the ranking A over B over C. And as we've seen, candidate B is declared the winner. So naturally, this group would like more people to jump on board to their ranking. So they wanna gather more and more people to jump on board. Suppose they go out and they gather two more voters who agree with their ranking. If they do that, what happens is candidate C is declared the winner. So the no-show paradox, if you just turn it around, you really see it's the no-show paradox and the twin paradox are really uh, two sides of the same coin. They're, they're essentially the same, same phenomena. So this is an example of the no-show paradox, again, with plurality with runoff. Now, I'll point you to this website that has a nice discussion of an actual election, the Burlington-Vermont mayoral race, in which it's argued that we actually saw an example of non-monotonicity at play. There are many other variants of failures of monotonicity that we don't have time to discuss here, but let me just discuss one interesting theorem. This is a theorem by Hervé Moulin. And Moulin showed that if there are four or more candidates, then Every Condorcet consistent voting method. So if the method is Condorcet consistent, so remember Condorcet consistent means if there exists a Condorcet winner, then that method will elect the Condorcet candidate. So if you're guaranteed to elect the Condorcet winner, then you have to be susceptible to the no-show paradox. So every, so Think of two desiderata. The first desiderata is always elect the Condorcet winner. The second desiderata is never be susceptible to the no-show paradox. Moulin showed that these two desiderata conflict with each other. You cannot find a voting method that satisfies both of these desiderata. 
So this is certainly counterintuitive. Many people view failures of monotonicity as being a devastating problem for voting methods.